Um, what I shared last week as well is that we know that all good PLCs begin with a, with a foundation of trust. And that is difficult to do, perhaps virtually, because we also know that our communication is mostly affected by our nonverbal cues and our nonverbal cues, how we're holding our body. Um, and so uh, our team is really learning different ways that we can encourage trust and between ourselves. And one of the ways we can do that is to also say that we're not gonna use any names of individuals. We're, not, we're going to focus on not using the names of schools or of people. And we try to phrase our questions or our thoughts in ways that we can protect the identity of people. And so this is a common agreement that we have amongst ourselves. And so any of you who are joining us this evening, and we ask that you also kind of abide by that rule. Okay, so um, it is my great pleasure tonight. Uh, Robin Conrad Hansen has, uh, will be facilitating a conversation. I'll work with her to share our thoughts about how we will be uh, learning, how to keep learning from a distance. So. Robin, please uh, begin. Well, good evening, good morning, and whatever part of the globe you're in, it's about 8 a.m. for us here on Pacific Standard Time in Arizona. Um, I thank um, my boss, Michael Schwanenberger from the university for sitting in today. Also, um, some other dear friends are on, and I'll talk about them in just a little bit. Um, but today's conversation I put in the chat is just really a conversation about what's best for kids how do we reopen school if we reopen school? Um, there's no one right answer to anything. And I really appreciate all of your feedback and your comments um, as to what you're thinking about doing. Some of you may not even be out of school yet. Um, so thinking about re-entering may be a thought that's down the road, but there's no time like the present. And so the information that I'm bringing up just as conversation starters um, would be information that I have been researching for the past several weeks since the last time we had a conversation about what does it look like for reopening schools. So Shannon, if you go to the next slide, please. So these are the topics that I thought we could talk about today. So I put them up and maybe make some notes as to when we get to this, that you have some things that you'd like to share or questions that you'd like mm -hmm. to ask. Um, but before even opening in the fall, I think we do need to think about summer learning and the COVID, they're calling it now the COVID summer slide instead of the typical sl summer slide that we have. And how as educators, are we going to be closing that achievement gap with our students? Um, I have a family, a personal example. My grandson, Jameson, is a very young kindergartner. He's only five years old. He's, he's still five. He won't turn six until July 18th. He starts back to school in the fall on August 3rd. When school shut down for us in March, which was spring break, um, he was already behind. He wasn't, he didn't have letter recognition, sound recognition to be consistent. He wasn't writing his name. Um, very smart kid, but he's very immature. He couldn't attend to things. And so at this point, I'm extremely concerned for him and other kids that are like him as far as what is the summer slide going to do to Jameson? And he now has to be ready to come back to school as a first grader with someone who still doesn't have letter recognition and sound recognition. So he is not alone in that group of kids. So what are we going to be doing for the Jamesons of the world and then all the other um, students that are out there that have possibly special needs that have not been identified yet or that do have special needs or just are struggling, didn't have the support at home over the summer as we're doing this remote learning. The next topic that we're talking about is return to school in the fall with confidence. And then who gets to decide how school opens in the fall? I know we all have all different job titles and job responsibilities who are in this group. So I want to hear from everybody. If you're a classroom teacher, if you're an office, a, a principal, if you're a district office person, um, if you're at the university level, please weigh in on what your thoughts are. And then what will it look like inside our classrooms for the fall? Are we physical distancing? I think that's the term now a little bit more than social distancing because we don't want a social distance. Um, that's leading partly to the um, anxieties, to the depression, to the mental, um, mental concerns, mental health concerns. So we want to, we're physical distancing, but what is your state, your school, your province that you work in? What are they saying that you have to do for school? And then um, how will COVID-19 change instruction for the better or for the worse? 
Um, as a, again, personal example, I can tell you my online, my remote instruction has skyrocketed during this time because my, all of my courses now are online. So I am really getting better and better with the use of online tools and technology. And thanks to the university, we're getting a lot of professional development and a lot of training that's available. And then how do we care for our most fragile? And our most fragile include our students, but it's also our faculty and staff. If you look, um, I know nationally in the United States, more than 50% of our teachers are over the age of 50, 55, which actually puts them in at risk for COVID and attracting the disease. So what are we doing to help them? Because their anxiety level is also going on the rise about coming back to school and feeling comfortable about that. We're already in an age where we have teacher shortages and um, principal shortages. So how is that going to compound this issue? And then lastly, let's talk about why educators worry about too much screen time and will it affect learning and what do the experts say? And so Zoka would love to hear you weigh in also on what you've learned in your research and cyberbullying, because we know the more screen time kids have, um, the more they're going to get involved in, in things that maybe parents don't even know about. So we'll touch on that. I don't mean to end on a sour note, but I think it's a very important note that we need to be talking about. So I have some research that goes along with each one of these areas just as a conversation starter. But please, once I put that out there, I want to stop talking and I want to hear from all of you and your experiences. So Shannon, please, Great. next slide. So here's a little research known about um, the COVID-19 and children. And this came out of the observer just, and all of these are within a few weeks old as far as the research. So this was from Sunday, um, May 17th, 2020. So the most striking feature, oops, oops, sorry. That's all right. So the most striking feature about the impact of COVID-19 on children is how little research has been conducted in the field. So a handful of studies have shown about caring across the world and scientists are divided about the interpretation of our kids, the carriers, can students, can young children actually get COVID like older, more at risk people, or if you have a fragile immune system. Another thought was as a result, politicians and others are now asking to decide how we open schools in the fall in order to protect our children's mental health and education without any clear guidance about the risk triggering a second wave of COVID-19 and infecting the school staff. So some are saying you have to come back wearing full face masks. Some are saying they're doing temperature checks before kids can even come into school. Um, it, it, the hand washing, the sanitizing, the physical distancing, is that something we really need to do based on research and based on children? Or is that something we don't need to do? Um, it's just unknown at this point. And then also, is it known that children are less likely to become ill if infected with the coronavirus, but researchers are still unsure how easily they can, be, they can infect others? Some research indicates that children are far less likely to become infected compared to adults, but other studies are now suggesting that they do become infected, then they are carriers of the viral load as an adult and therefore pose a real risk of passing this virus on to others. So it's one side of the fence or the other. There's research that is saying both, but we need more time to know what's actually in the best interest of our students based on their physiology and what our kids carry. And that's a child with normal immune system. Um, so then closing the achievement gap. This is the topic that I wanted to bring up about all of our kids as far as we know the summer slide. So here's some research out of the Northwest Evaluation Association that students in grades three through five typically lose about 20% of their literacy and 27% of math knowledge during a regular summer. However, due to COVID and now the COVID slide or the C19 slide, they'll be even more dramatic in terms of losing the gains that they had made. And oftentimes, unless you're in Shannon's area or in Austria, or I heard that there's some areas in the Netherlands that opened up after a couple of weeks when Cody was talking the other week that they had opened back up. But the majority of the world has stayed closed and is closed. So students are, it's an optional for remote learning or even if it's mandatory for remote learning, are the students really learning what they could have or should have if they were in a typical face-to-face -face classroom? So what the research now is saying that the loss we can consider is third through fifth grade students will now see up to a 30% literacy loss and as much as 50% math loss. 
So with that, what recommendations could you offer or are you thinking about within your school or personally about how are you going to make up for this achievement gap in our most at risk students um, within your school? So this is where I'm going to stop talking and please share. What are your thoughts? So Ukane, I'm wondering if you would share a little bit about what we're doing with our summer program. Absolutely. So um, I totally agree with this um, um, last research and the slide that you shared, Ms. Um, Robin. I've also looked at it while I was preparing the summer reading uh, program for the students and also uh, the math um, program for, for students. So what we are doing, what we have decided as a team, as math team to do this year is create a list of books based on um, students' uh, read scores for each grade level. Um, as well, uh, try to find PDF versions or audio versions and include them in that, um, in that plan. We have also created a um, book review um, sample uh, that we will give to the students as a sample and then they can use that sample to reflect uh, on their readings. Uh, we have also decided the dates and the deadlines when they should submit their work during summer and we have done this in order to uh, keep them accountable and to in a way, make this whole process more serious so that they um, stick to the plan and then um, don't take it just like every summer, let's say. So this summer is absolutely not like other summers. Huh? So we have tried to create a plan that will keep their uh, minds busy during this time and in a way, try to engage them more so that the loss will not be that, that uh, big. So that's for reading. We have also uh, created um, a plan for Albanian language. So basically, each of our students is obliged to read at least three English books based on their read scores and minimum one Albanian book, uh, again, based on their um, reading level. Uh, for all this reading uh, materials, they have to do the book review. There is another package that we have included, which we have taken from the ReadWorks. It's um, mostly about um, informational text, and um, it has um, worksheets to, to fill in, vocabulary work, and it's for each grade level from grade one to grade 12. This is for reading. For math, we have continued using Khan Academy as we have been working and students are familiar with that program for, for years now. And um, we are creating um, assignments, again, based on their read scores. Uh, for, uh, so they will have three uh, assignments, one in June, one in July and one in August. We have also created deadlines for each of them where teachers will have to check and report to, uh, to students and to their parents about the progress. So just like never before, I think, Ms. Shannon, no, really. we have tried to create something uh, that will really keep them busy. We have also created a, a guide uh, to guide teach uh, to guide uh, parents and students uh, how to use this material uh, with dates and with every detail and also the reasons based on this research Miss Robin is already sharing. So then also we decided well how do we get parents and children to really buy into this over the summer and we said so we're going to try to share through the homeroom teachers and. Yeah. So we're sharing in all levels throughout the organization. And we're hoping that that makes a difference. What's interesting too is Ukane is talking about our RIT scores. And we went through a really interesting kind of challenging time where we, uh, here comes Christy, uh, uh, 
different, maybe a different Christie, where we uh, decided we would do map testing remotely. Oh, yeah. And um, so that was very, very interesting. And we did find that our scores were higher. And actually our high school students did a science and math project based on looking at all the numbers, comparing this year with last year. And also these high school students giving uh, inferences about why they thought the scores were higher at this time. And so in our area where we're saying what this slide might be, I really question um, this. I think it is a hypothesis. Fantastic. You guys are above the curve. I mean, you're doing fantastic work. I have a slide coming up also that kind of shares across the board what's happening in the United States as far as summer programming. But Ukani, way to go. I mean, that's amazing work, Shannon, congratulations. Because the engagement piece is very important. Students aren't feeling very engaged. Um, they're not even showing up for the remote learning or the classes and there's not much for accountability. And parents truly appreciate it. I mean, they have full-time jobs they're trying to do as well as work with their students now through their academic learning. And it's really getting tough. And I think we're putting a lot of stress on our families and our, our parents. So having that parent engagement and that parent information that you talked about, Ikani, I think that's, that's the key. Good job. So interesting, Robin, about this. I was talking with our preschool teacher today, and um, we only have our preschool and kindergarten back. And okay. one, of the, one of the mothers came in and was recognizing the children in the class based on the remote learning that we had done. And so um, as, as you've been talking about what your experience is in America, we, I rarely think of America as being a part of the gap right? Mm -hmm. But uh, the socioeconomic impact in America, it seems like it's had such an uh, impact. It's going higher. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. going up. How about others that are on the call? Yeah. What are you seeing and, and um, what recommendations? Robin, let me uh, thank you for everyone for inviting me today and uh, interesting beginning to the conversation and, and something that, again, just substantiates that what we're looking at around the world that this is not something that is unique to any any country or, or area or culture. It's something that we're we're all dealing with, and quite frankly, as we all know, it's it's new to all of us. And I think as we I think you froze, Michael. Or hello, everyone. What we know about schools for a new opening, whenever that new opening would be. And so it's, I think, along with that in, in this reinvention, it, we have the opportunity to look at what we've done previously. And if we're talking about summer and, and the gap and, and what students lo lose uh, over the summer, I think it provides us again an opportunity to look at what have we done previously. And can we build upon that? Can we make it better? Um, you know, can we look at the research? Can we truly, in, even in this short time frame, you know, can we um, try to develop a system or systems that are more workable and will work, work for all of our students? And we use that term all the time that, that you know, we want to uh, have success for all of our students. But, you know, as you just mentioned, there is a, there is a huge, there are huge achievement gaps, so and there are huge socioeconomic gaps in in our country and, and across the world. Um, so I, I applaud what uh, we we all are talking about today and doing, uh, because one of the best learning opportunities is from colleague to colleague. Um, so, Dr. Michael, so, last week we talked about the benefit that those who have not gone back to school have, because mm -hmm. like you said, this is a time to really identify the gems or the challenges and redesign what might happen in September. I'm curious, is there anyone else on the call today that is back to school right now? Let, let me comment and also again, I'm sorry, I was going to but there is, for all of us, there is political pressure 
to bring our schools or open up our schools to bring our, our students back to the learning environment. And so depending on what the political pressure is, uh, we'll have a lot to say in when, when schools reopen. We would like to think as educators that we can make that, that decision, but I don't believe that, uh, that most educators are going to be able to do that. Mary Kay, did you want to reply to that? Okay, your microphone is muted. Can you unmute yourself? No, I've just been uh, uh, really impressed with what you have been doing this summer. And I'm hoping there are ways that that information can be shared across the United States so that we can maybe move together more quickly in the direction that will be most effective for all kids. Thank you. Glad you're here, Mary Kay. Thank you, Robin. Thank you for inviting me. So that's interesting, Ukane, is that maybe, you know, how we have that one document that we put all those things together. Maybe yeah. we want to share that in some way with other schools. And no um, it would be really interesting. We can, I wanted on our website to start uh, posting resources or if we're able to, re to post some of these recordings. Um, so this might be something that we add there. Mm -hmm. No okay. problem. So, um, Dr. Robin, are you ready to move forward? Yes, today? please. Okay. It's, so here's the follow-up to the first one, that the academic erosion, what can be done to close the achievement gap in lieu of COVID-19. So here's what we're talking about. Again, it's the United States. Some of these articles are more global that we'll get to. But nationally, there was a survey that came out of district leaders May 20, um, between the 20th and 28th of May in Ed Week that the research shows that 24% of all educators who responded to this national survey said that they finalized their summer plans, that they have already finalized their summer plans. 38% though described their summer plans as in progress and 11% said that they have not even started thinking about summer plans. So that was just very disheartening to me as to how we're gonna close this achievement gap when you haven't even started planning for summer. And I know we start and end school very differently in the United States. Um, Arizona, it's, we finished before Memorial Day, in, which is, was May 21st, we finished school. Um, however, 27% said that either they never offer summer school or had decided not to offer it this year. And I thought of any time that we need to be offering summer school to our kids, it doesn't even matter what it looks like. It doesn't have to be well-structured, it's just reading opportunities. Um, here's books, uh, do some FaceTime with your teachers that so you pick a, do a book study, you know, depending on the grade level. Teachers could be just reading to their kids if they're the younger ages. Um, but something that we should be doing, almost thinking of our schools being the libraries that they used to, where parents used to take their kids to libraries in the summer. And that's just literacy. What about math literacy? You know, we're gonna lose Found in math that we're losing in reading and there's nothing being planned in so much a part of our country and I wonder if this is representative worldwide. Now we're hearing in Kosovo and Pristina that it's not. You guys are well above the curve but I think you're one of the outliers. I wish that you were the, the, the common thread but I, I think that you're one of the outliers Shannon and Ukani with all the work that you're doing. But how about anybody else um, going back with this research? Are you hearing that places are starting with summer school programs for their kids or are they not? Where in these statistics might you have heard? I'm looking at the people I'll who are just, here. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not working in a K to 12 school, but when I used to work in K to 12 schools in internationally that were, um, what, uh, how do I say, true international students where the students weren't from the host country. Many of those students leave during the summer, so there weren't really summer programs, so to speak. Anyway, so I don't know, you know, the situation now on those types of schools where the host, where the students aren't, the majority aren't from the host country. Um, what they would be offering for summer school. But from my experience, when I worked in those schools where the students were not um, from the host country, they weren't there in the summer to even offer summer school. Neither were the teachers because they were international teachers. They left to go to their home countries as well. So 
um, the whole summer school thing wasn't really um, a big deal. There, there was some summer school, um, a little bit, some teachers might have stayed, but it wasn't like a huge thing, like what it needs to be in this situation or this summer specifically, you know, so I don't know um, what it might be now because a lot of people may be forced to stay in those countries um, due to travel restrictions or just purely for safety rather than trying to travel home countries. Um, but that that's, I don't know, I guess I'm not working in a K school right now, so internationally or, or in the States, so it's difficult for me to say, but that's what it, you know, what it was like when I was working in those schools where the students were not from the host country. So Robin, I, I think you're, thank you, Angie. Um, I think you've given a good perspective. It's true. There are two other schools in our community where they are, they have a higher international uh, population. And when I've talked with those directors, they have not done anything for summer planning. Mm -hmm. Now, according to the COBIS research, uh, we know now that 25% of international schools have about 75% local population. So there's a growing trend of our schools having more and more local students. Um, but I agree with you, under the profile that you've described, I, I haven't heard of any programs. Um, so also, Robin, you're saying, uh, really, I don't know of another school that has embarked on a design of a program like we have. We even have introduced a kinder camp and we're trying to do a summer school if students are allowed to come to campus based on the Ministry of Health and, and the politics of the country. But I think it's because of what I was saying is everyone is kind of scrambling and adjusting to what is, and they're caught in this political sandwich. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is why this has been such a difficult time for us and for me being so busy is because in our situation, we were really looking at um, the school concern about being a private school, we're dependent on our enrollment. And right. so if people can't afford to stay in a private school, you know, our survival is really at stake. So we're working really hard to try to be all things to all people. And um, yeah, but I think it is unique. I don't know of another school around that is, that is this, thinking this far ahead most people are just surviving christy um a warning what, good what morning. you do what you say. again robin nice uh, i just i have a couple examples um i'm partnering with a company locally here um a digital learning alliance and we've created an, a summer elementary program for k6 and we partnered with public television um, company mm -hmm. in order to provide some face-to-face -face because we're finding that that early literacy, you know, that is not something you can teach well virtually that, that we found. If somebody's figured that out, please share. Mm -hmm. um, so we've, we've done our best to get a summer offering available. And then I'm actually managing the development of a, a K-6 virtual uh, offering. Uh, with that that school, but what I really wanted to share is we had some schools that that were feeling the exact same way you were, Shannon. And we know how how we need to get kids, you know, learning. So they offered an on-site uh, program, and one of the adults tested positive for COVID. Mm. And so that early effort shut down that any conversation about trying to do an online or a face-to-face uh, -face offering. So we're just feeling, I guess, that that almost reinvigorated the panic about what is school going to look like in the fall. And to what you said earlier, Shannon, I think what it did is anybody that felt the, the need to get kids back on site or school up and going again, just recoiled at that and said, you know what, I'm just, I'm just going to try to survive the summer and not even think about what school is going to look like. And because we didn't have an opportunity to bring teachers back, um, they just, they went to summer break and which they should have. I mean, that, that's something they've earned. And so we're just in this, how do we offer something digitally? And then Robin, with what you said, so many parents are trying to survive as well. And the stress in their homes and just trying to 
meet basic needs. And then now I have to try to figure out four passwords to get on three different platforms <laughs> and figure out what time I'm supposed to do that. It, it just, I mean, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, but uh, yeah, we're feeling the pain here. Yeah. And to Angie's point too, I really appreciate the Amer the international um, aspect because that's true. Kids are traveling all over with their families, but this summer I think may be different. The travel may be curtailed. And so that would have been a great time to have programs for advancement and engagement for students over the summer. And so then I think about those kids and those families that are now not able to go home, um, which may add more anxiety to them and increase their, their depression because they wanted to be by family. And now if they're not able to travel, um, that's another level of concern that we need to be aware of. Thank you very much for sharing. Go ahead, Shannon, if you wanna move okay. forward to the next one. So this is kind of to Michael's point. Who's deciding what school will look like in the fall? And it is very political. Um, it, I think there needs to be a complex decision-making team, but who's going to be on that team? So when superintendents and their school districts are looking, when principals are looking, do you actually get to make that final decision? Or is that going to be made at a state or federal level or national level um, as far as what we're able to do? So, you know, definitely follow the tools that are made available through your state and CDC guidelines, parents, staff, what surveys they have, and be able to collaborate with other educators like what we're doing. And then some decisions to be made. So this is just to add to the conversation is how to move the academic needle. So again, we've been talking about the loss that we're probably going to see greater than what we normally would see during a summer slide. And so that use of data, Shannon said that she was able to do map testing. Most people were, did not do. They waived, the states and nation waived their spring testing. So we don't have the normal data we would have had to be able to check to see the growth or decline of our students. So the use of formative assessments are gonna be even more valuable than we've ever had. But my worry is that people are gonna be assessing too much. We need to do a quick formative assessment that could take a couple minutes and then move on. One of the thoughts in some of our schools back here was to bring the kids back to school in the same classroom where they left at spring break. So that teacher knows those kids the best, the anxiety would be lower, and they could just make up quickly in nine weeks as much as they possibly could, and then move them on into the next grade was one consideration. Also, what professional development would be available for teachers and staff? Mentoring for new teachers. Michael and I are at the university level. So we have new administrators and student teachers that we work with on a regular basis. Their internship experience was cut short this year. So they didn't get to see all the valuable pieces that a normal intern would have had. And so we've got to have support and mentoring for them coming back in the fall. And then also what are the daily schedules going to look like and remote learning options? What are the needs for technology? Because not all kids are coming back, even if you open your schools, if they have a fragile immune system, if the anxiety is too high, or if there's other reasons, um, we've got to make sure that we have cameras, uh, dot cameras, microphones, they can join um, synchronously via Zoom, I think would be one great way to do that. Um, and then, um, let's see, and then pre-planning for the likelihood of school cl closures. Because even if we do get to start, the chances that we're gonna stay open for an entire mm. year, I think are very much diminished because of just what Christy said, it's that recoil effect. If one person, something happens, they're gonna shut it all down again. I think that's a reflective um, knee jerk reaction, but I think we need to be planning for that, that it could close overnight. So what plans are we making to continue our learning now remotely? So those are just some conversation starters again. So pick and choose wherever you want to go. And what are your thoughts about what will it look like? Who's making these decisions? Are you part of the decision-making team? Are you even being asked what your thoughts are? So Mary Kay, I don't know if you've contributed. I'd love to hear any of your thoughts on this. Well, right now I'm mostly just a listener and just trying to hear your conversations and what's going on with you in the summer. I think everybody is in a similar place. I don't know that there's some um, strong communication systems going on. I think people needed mm -hmm. a break from everything, not only uh, for the kids, but also for the staff. So I think your conversation is right on. I think you're going to be leaders in what's happening in the United States. And I'm hoping that I can do what I can to uh, share some of that information so that others can learn from you. 
Thank you, Mary Kay. Um, Rebecca, I know you, um, do you have any, oh, Christy, did you want to talk? I just briefly, um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to, to say our governor just um, pulled together two committees, uh, one on the um, reopening uh, schools in the fall, what that would look like. And then I was trying to find the, the um, name of the other one. But to your point, Robin, um, there, there, I think there's one teacher on e either of those committees. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I just, I guess it's just important to think through as we start to develop those committees, who are the stakeholders that need to be making the decisions? And I think my recommendation would be, we need to get as many teachers in those rooms as possible number one, to see what it feels like from their perspective, but also they are the ones that we are putting at risk in this position. Right. And if we get their voice in the room, we are better suited to be able to design a plan that will address their safety, whether it's physical and or mental. Good points. So one of the things we talked about at the last meeting was just the anxiety and how and how to manage that. And what Inez had shared was really trying to find the data and the research. And that was really something that took me, uh, that I agreed with when Robin presented. She said, one of the biggest things that are bothering us is that we don't really know, has the virus effect or the impact, has it decreased uh, going into summer? Is it really true that younger people are resilient or they're passing along the virus? So I, I would say that we need more and more information by September. That would really be helpful. So I know we have a global uh, race to try to find um, an immunization for this, but I wonder if there's anyone out there really doing the kind of analysis so that when we put a team together, that's teachers and leaders and developing economies, if we can say, you know, we need to take the risk, these are the things we're doing, and we want to start in September, or this is the kind of plan we're doing. We're doing smaller class sizes where half of it is remotely and half of it is in the school. Um, can teachers, can schools come up with plans that we can propose? even if the government is in disagreement. Yes, um, I think Rebecca, did you want to say something? Your, your microphone is muted, Rebecca. Do you know how to unmute yourself? I can. Okay, nope, you're still muted. There you go, okay. great. There we go. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah, one thing that I think is important is there's universities now who they completed the spring semester or quarter online, and that seemed to go relatively well with the students they had begun the term with. Now that they're moving into summer uh, term, and a whole new set of students in their class, it's much more difficult. So I think that is an indicator in terms of the students staying with that teacher uh, to, for the summer program for this transition. Because if the university students are, and professors are having difficulty getting that connection, uh, think about our young kids mm -hmm. and how difficult that might be for them. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that's a point to consider. And then I think it takes us back to, in terms of preparing students, is how important that formative assessment will be and what, uh, staying with those foundational skills because our time, we have mm -hmm. to make up some time. And so what are the real critical skills that the students are missing uh, from this experience that we could move them up, uh, not just, you know, let's not just have a fluffy kind of, oh, we're having summer school kind of thing, uh, have it very specific to moving them forward with their foundational skills. So Rebecca, today I saw my teacher in preschool had found a 30-day free 
um, application that assesses students sight words and and uh, letters and this kind of thing very quickly and she was surprised at how much her students had actually grown during this time because now she's physically with them i'm thinking maybe it would be helpful if we if we kind of create a list of assessments that we think would do exactly what you said and do it quickly now and also robin brought this up right um, we're worried that over assessing kids so maybe as a team we could create a list of products that we would recommend for quick assessments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Here's the students. Mm -hmm. yep. Ms. Shannon? Yeah. Um, uh, today, while I was presenting the summer um, reading and math uh, program, mm -hmm. uh, I have four students who will go back to their countries next year. Uh, one in Nepal and three in Bulgaria, and they were like, teacher but the schools where we are going they they don't have they didn't send us anything for summer should i work with the things that you gave me now or how you know they were confused and um yeah right on the spot i said of course you are my students you know no matter that you're going there you we have to keep in touch and you are going to work on this are you going to reply? I said, of course I'm going to reply. <laughs> so what I want to say is that they also fear, you know, uh, mm -hmm. as you said, if we could give them some time, um, if we go back in, in, in fall to be with the same teachers, they are, I mean, even my students now, they are like, yeah, but when we go back, you know, you're not going to be with us. So what if we continue again virtually? We don't know that teacher, you know? Mm. So it is, it, kids have started now to feel, to really feel this, you know? So we have to think um, more about this. Uh. Uh, well, so, actually, uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. The most common uh, question that I have from all students and most of the mothers are calling me about, you know, some concern. It was, is it safe to go back to school? You know, it's a big concern. You can realize that uh, children are hiding their concern, but you know, uh, through their different questions they were asking, is you know exactly the same concern. If it's uh, safe to go back, or can we hug our friend, or are we just going to view of them? You know, so yeah, well, it is uh, anxiety's level is in top. Unfortunately, most of the students, they did went through anxieties, but um, hopefully the summer will be a bit, you know, um, a bit of hope for uh, our students and for every child in the world. So maybe that will be a bit of fun. So they're gonna forget a little bit and go out of all these anxieties. Very nice, thank you. Mm -hmm. Shannon, do you wanna to move to the next slide if there's no other conversations? Yeah. So this one, um, I'm always very curious about what will learning look like for all of our learners? And just throwing out a little bit as far as learning in the brain and how we know about the neuroscience that reveals two facts about the brain that every educator, parent, and student knows that emotion is essential to the learning and that each brain is unique. While these two facts are likely familiar to educators, we may not have realized that each of these are potential to transform our teaching practices and empower students' autonomy for learning. And I don't want us to forget the power of emotion when we're doing our lessons because I'm seeing a lot of still paper pencil type learning, um, even on websites, you may have a, an app that you're working on, but when are we triggering the kid's emotion? When are we getting to that deeper learning that they're gonna really be able to hold on to? And so in-person, online, remote, blended, the physical distancing, health checks before entering mass, um, social emotional learning, the caring for those that are most at need, what are some thoughts that you have or maybe conversations that you've been a part of within your educational system as far as looking out for not only the academic, but what about the, um, the social emotional learning? What about just emotion that we find with learning in general? 
What are your thoughts with that? And, and what are you thinking about caring for the most needy kids? So I think, Christy, did you want to talk with that first? Well, I've, I've had the experience just with adults and, and professional development of I've transitioned almost all of my PD to um, virtual. And one of the things I keep being mindful of is the people that are on the other end, they're, they're, there are a lot of different states of emotional well-being, mm -hmm. and there's no time like the present to remind us how important laughter is yeah. and movement. So through that professional development, I have embedded things like now get up and go find the strangest thing in the room, or <laughs> and then come and share it and hold it up, and just seeing mm. people laugh and have fun. And and as I'm working on this program um, for elementary, encouraging teachers to do the same thing get kids up and laughing. And I know that it, it creates this chaos and that virtual classroom management um, is very, very challenging in and of itself. But if you can get kids laughing, all those hormones that flood through our system to make us feel good are released. And then again, we have a toolbox full of, let's bring them back together um, so we can continue with the learning. But I would say more than anything, tools and resources that get kids laughing and moving regardless of whether it's a virtual setting or not. Wow, that's what a great tip. Very good. So let's add to this little, this Christy uh, highlight where she was saying uh, like a, a tip of what she has done with her students, even if they're adults. Um, does anyone else have something that you've done that has encouraged laughter or movement in your online virtual session or on your virtual sessions? Miss mm -hmm. Shannon, mm -hmm. um, uh, we have created mini gardens uh, last week with our students. I mean, each student had to create a miniature garden. Mm -hmm. And then while they were presenting, um, one of them accidentally, I mean, it was not planned, but just like that, he uh, started uh, using the, the little dolls that uh, he used to put in the, in the garden and to kind of talk, you know, oh. make like a role play. <laughs> and it turned to be so funny. And then uh, we decided all of us to create, to make stories with those gardens little gardens so what they're doing now uh, these days they are recording them so they had to write a kind of play short play and then to use their voice for different characters so mm. i'm really mm. i can't wait to see what it's going to, <laughs> to turn wow know? wow that's great I'd love to hear any more of these, any moments you've had of real laughter with people. I, I really resonate with what you're saying, Christy. Mm -hmm. I had uh, some different conversations this last week and where just laughing with people online was so much, was so positive. So thank you. For uh, actually with a psychology class, they were uh, seniors and uh, every second lesson that we kept we decided to do 15 minutes last 15 minutes just talk talk positive do not say anything negative and then i was uh, calling yon which was very very funny boy and i was saying yon are you sleeping can you hear us and he didn't answer and then he suddenly just opened the uh, camera and he was in a tie you know, and he said, I put on this uh, suit and tie because uh, we don't have graduation uh, ceremony. Oh. And that, we uh, actually, we laughed and I felt that I'm going to cry for them because uh, they were really, really sad about this situation. It wasn't fair for their, um, for their age. They were uh, waiting for prom and graduation, but uh, hopefully we can do something in uh, September for them. So Zoga, you know we are going to have a ceremony, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just to make sure. <laughs> I don't want to monopolize okay. the, the conversation, but I think it's important to, to mention that any strategies that we use to teach uh, equity, uh, one of the the key pieces is allowing kids to bring themselves into the environment. Mm -hmm. And so a really fun strategy is to have them tell the story of how they got their name. 
-hmm. and what their name means. And then also addressing the environment. I love that now Zoom has these new backgrounds you can put up that are fun, like you're at the beach or you're you know, flying a spaceship. But as teachers, being really mindful of the environment um, and, and making it welcoming and engaging. And that's challenging if you're not comfortable with technology, but I think we're going to up, have to up our game in that area. And you know, I, I, again, one of the great things I think, if anything came out of COVID, is um, the, the focus on the importance of embedding technology into our education system and instructional process. Uh, and we've all, as Robin, you mentioned, we, we've had to get a lot better at a lot of things in a fast amount of time. So just those environmental things, the social emotional things that we would do in a brick and mortar classroom, having our teachers be mindful of each of those individual uh, pieces and layering that with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. What are some strategies that we can create in that virtual setting that address those basic needs as well? Very good. Great. Robin, do you make any connections with this that you want to point out something? Does something come into mind for you? Well, one of the things we're doing at the university is all, just because we're going to start opening um, in the fall, but we're coming back two weeks early and then we're going to end before Thanksgiving, before the cold and flu season hits. So we're coming back in person, um, but all of us as faculty need to be prepared to do at any given time a synchronous course through Zoom that students may be in person, but then others may be coming in through Zoom at the same time. We need to be ready for asynchronous courses um, and that students may be coming in person one time, but not the next time. And how are you gonna juggle all that? How are you gonna create your shell that we use? We use Blackboard. So how do we create our shell to make it as interactive and as personal as possible? So that's, I actually have a four day training this week that I'm going through trying to learn all these new techniques and I'm, I, my skill level just continues to climb. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited about the fall. I'm excited about sharing with others and ideas that they have to really make the experience best for my students, my graduate students at the master's and doctoral level, but then also to be able to share ideas for our pre-K 12 system as well. Um, because I do believe in notion, emotion needs to be a part of it. Talking like what Christy was saying, about going off and getting something. Um, you know, I was with my grandkids the last week of school. And so I was doing, all right, who has to be online at what time to, with what teacher and what class and their end of the year party. We certainly couldn't have missed that. And the teacher sent the kids on a scavenger hunt to go mm. find different things. And so, you know, it was just really fun. Get them up, get them moving, keep them engaged. Um, and so I, I love to hear and share the ideas and the creativity that's coming out. Um, which more and more will do that. So I like your idea, Shannon, of maybe even have a resource page on the website for a variety mm -hmm. of different topics. And then we can start um, it's, um, populating that with all these great ideas uh, that we can have and we can use uh, or we can share with others. Great. I think that'd be fantastic. So, um, I was just going to add to that because I teach um, university courses online as well. And um, my, my, the whole program that I teach in um, is a master's degree program, and it's all the courses I teach are online. So um, this COVID thing didn't affect the courses I teach or the students that I teach, but a lot of the other professors that are on campus, I mean, it made a huge difference for them to have to shift to online within, you know, in two weeks' time. So it was a, it was a big deal. But one of the things that I do, um, a teaching online is I do a lot of video notes so and I require students to do video notes so in our discussions or Shannon you'll know how um, when we were at Wilkes how we had a discussion topic and we'd type in our what our response was and we reply to other people well I have um, students do a video note as a response and they need to reply to each other with a video note rather than typing a response so it makes it it's not the same as sitting there in the room having a discussion but at least they're like talking you know you've got a video of a person replying saying what they think about you know whatever the topic might be and someone replying to them you know by voice and video rather than just you know typing it out so um, but I be, I've been doing that for a couple semesters, but I think that it does make a difference. And for some students that are used to taking all online courses, it's 
they're not that excited about it, but, <laughs> but then they get used to it and they're like, oh yeah, that's so much better. You know, it's like, yeah, you'll get used to it, you know? So I don't do that on every discussion topic, but I do do it on some and for sure the personal introduction, they have to introduce themselves and they have to reply to each other that way as well. But, and then some of the discussions we do that way just with a video note. Um, and the platform we use is Brightspace or D2L. Um, so it's, it's, it's all built in. You can do a video note, but that's at university level. And so I'm going to add, add to that. One of the things I loved about our program, Angie, was that somehow our professors were able to give feedback to our work. And so again, I think that's a lot of uh, improving or engaging personal relationships. So I, I don't know how we're doing and our school is doing with a lot of uh, feedback that way, but I think it really makes a difference during this time. I'm gonna move on to the next slide, Shannon. Yes. So here's just some ideas um, for caring for children and our educators. We've talked about the teachers too. I know Christy brought this up. Is, and these are just questions posed. So how best to support children in our schools with chronic diseases and mental health concerns? And how are schools supporting children on IEPs and 504s? And are we making up all the hours that they needed and that they were given? Um, are some of our children going hungry during this time of school shutdowns? Are they getting their, their daily lunches, maybe their breakfasts? Um, you know, are we thinking about all of that? Are our schools acting as the center of care for our community and supporting our parents as well? And then how best to increase student attendance and engagement during the time of uncertainty for our schools? And then how to support our staff who are most at risk and anxious about contracting COVID-19? And I'm gonna ask my friend Mary Kay, um, because there's, you'll see at the bottom, there's a link to an article that just came out in Principal Magazine with NAESP. And this article is about re related to absenteeism and not only absenteeism, but in the United States, uh, Mary Kay and I are a part of um, WEF, the World Education Foundation, that is looking to see how we can get the 6 million children, school-age children in school who are not attending any form of school whatsoever. And that includes online, homeschooling, parochial, public, private, charter, they're not attending any. So this is a, a link to that um, article that's in Principal Magazine. And Mary Kay and two other past presidents of NAESP are part of that. But Mary Kay was really one of the founders in the United States. So Mary Kay, would you mind taking just a few minutes to share a little bit about the work that you're doing? Well, thanks, Robin. And you, by the way, are one of the most critical people on our small group of, I guess, leaders in this adventure. Um, well, our goal is just to, first of all, try to find the kids that are not attending school. And uh, that's when school was normal. So now it's even bigger than we can even imagine. And I think probably uh, we're going to have to redefine what all that means and then what can we do to help support that which is kind of a good thing. It kind of shakes everything up and let's rethink what we need to do and how we need to do that. Um, so I think the, the general piece is that it's very scary when we have families in our country who are not taking the responsibility, if you will, to ensure that their kids are actually being educated anywhere, anytime, any way. So um, we know that that, uh, that exists we know of a variety of reasons of why that probably exists. They don't want to be found, et cetera. Uh, but there's still that contingency of kids. And if there's a group that probably most needs um, the extra external support of educators, it would probably be that group, but we need to find them. Some of the strategies we've looked at, and I don't know how that might fit in with today's world, but it, everything seems to be open as a new way of thinking anyway. Um, might be to look at who are the people in the community who might know of kids who are not being educated and how, even in today's world, how can we manage to make that a conversation piece, either with our own friends, with our neighbors, do you know of kids who are not attending any school, are not getting support? Is there a way that we can make that work for them if they're not 
it it houses with lots of kids and lots of people and they just don't know how to do that. Are there ways that we can um, find some support systems for these kids who probably need education more than anybody, at least educational support? So I don't know if that answers what you were hoping and that I would say, Robin, but I think we're all in this transition. It does bring up some thoughts though. Um, many of us uh, that are involved in this particular uh, mission of uh, the World Education Forum to find these kids, and that's it happening around the world. It's not just happening in our country, but we're pretty active here. Um, one of the things that's happening is we have educators who are so truly dedicated to kids, and then they retire. And some of them want to retire and they want to go do other things, which I do as well, but some of us still want to remain uh, involved in some way if we can be supportive. So one of my questions back to all of you is, as you look at ways to address these student needs that are so varied, and I heard such good ideas today, that are there ways that we can tap into some of our retired educators? They may not even be retired educators. It could be retired anybody who has an interest in helping kids. And are there ways that we could be part of that system? Are there ways that we could listen to children read online because it's going to be virtual? Are there ways that we can create some social emotional support for some kids? Uh, I think we need to open up the box and think totally differently that there are probably more people in the United States who would be willing to help kids. We just haven't figured out a way to tap into them and to make that work for all kids. So that's probably some of the big thoughts that are on my mind right now. Mary, I, Mary Kay, thank you so much for sharing. And I'm so glad that you're here joining with us today. Um, actually, I think two members who are in our team are retired. Uh, there might be another person that would be joining us that are retired, but one of the objectives we have would be to facilitate other uh, virtual groups. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think your idea of gathering retired educators would be a wonderful mission. Earlier, I think it was Robin who was, or was it Robin or maybe it was Christy who was talking about educators being burned out right now, where uh, many educators being stressed. They've just gone through four months of probably the most stressful time in their life, uh, having a family at home, also teaching online virtually. <clears throat> and so they need a break and they need a vacation. But at the same time, we need a platoon of passionate educators who are saying, can I read with you? Can we do math together? Hey, you want to join me? Um, now, if we could find them, as you are saying, if somehow we can create that list, I think it would be a, an interesting task. I think we should discuss it, whether we can really start building, are you a licensed uh, teacher who uh, is safe to be with? I guess that would be the other thing. Are you a licensed teacher that we can add to our list and um, connect you with kids in need? Um, but I think that this would be really interesting. All of us have networks. All of us know people maybe who are retired. And even if each one of us reached out to one person and said, hey, could you, uh, passionate retired educators, P-R-E, um, you know, passionate retired educators around the world and, and seeing what we could do. I think this is, a, it's a really interesting idea. Does anybody else? connect with this idea? Um, I am not retired, but I, would, <laughs> <laughs> but I would volunteer now. I mean, uh, you can wow. really count on me. Yes, absolutely. And uh, Dr. Shannon, maybe uh, we can connect with uh, Miss Elizabeth going mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. from Ideas Partnership. And uh, she is uh, actually looking for volunteer teachers uh, who could help her um, marginalized, let's say, community mm -hmm. that she's helping here in Kosovo. Um, so we can we can count that we at least we have a group of uh, kids here in Kosovo that we can help. Mm -hmm. They are there actually. We don't have to go and look for them. They are there. Right. And uh, we yeah. have them identified here, exactly. um, the Roma population, the Ashkali population, they're within a community. And really that's because of Elizabeth Going, who has really done 
so much yeah. work with that. So actually, Miss um, Mary Kay, there might be other organizations that have done some of this identification. So in our community, it's the ideas partnership. But in um, Angie's community in the UK, maybe there is um, SOS Village, even though um, I know that they still have people that care for them. But I'm sure, or UNESCO, we can probably get a list of nonprofit organizations and mm -hmm. maybe there's someone in, in there. This would be a huge project. Um, one of the things we find when we have our discussions is that it, it's great that we can identify these huge challenges, but I'm really a proponent of let's try to, okay, we see it being really big and then let's, let's see what we can actually do. What's a small step we can do? Um, and if you really want to help start creating a master list, I could see us trying to feed you names. Um, and I love the idea about volunteerism with grandparents and retired people and engaging kids and just being with them. That could be a huge conduit for the summer for summer learning. I know I FaceTime my granddaughter. She, she called a few minutes ago and we're reading, we just finished reading Charlotte's Web. Um, she's mm -hmm. doing, writing a book about her investigation as a secret spy, secret agent. So the next books we're going into are the Nan Nancy Drew series. Um, you know, but that's, that's, I think how kids can get engaged with other people, whether it's their grandparent or a grandparent figure. So that makes me think of like an advisory program right or like a mentoring program mm -hmm. so maybe um as adults whether we're retired or not maybe like we're having a once a week a thursday meeting maybe we would be willing to host a class discussion on a book that we're reading together so yeah. book talks with older students um one of the challenges is, I, I think, is just uh, grabbing hold of those students, identifying them, grabbing them, and then and connecting. Um, I think even right now, my high school teachers and middle school teachers, they, they are wanting and looking forward to that, to that vacation. Um, but I don't know about the students. You know, like we haven't really done a survey to ask our students um, do you want to do a book club over the summer with mm -hmm. Dr. Shannon? Do you want to do one with Ms. Zoga? Um, maybe we could do a survey, you know, in our schools. And I know actually Ukane and, um, has worked on a survey before with um, Arlene that we're looking at. But maybe we can even offer a survey to our students before the end of the year. Um, would you like to join a summer book club, a virtual summer book club? I like that idea. I, I'm going to send, I'm going to send out a note to, um, our, I have access to all the students in our school and I could say, you know, um, there's some of us who would like to stay connected to you over the summer. Would you like to do a summer reading group? Here are some books that we're thinking about reading this summer. Um, what do you think, Ukane? Yeah, absolutely. Why okay. not? Why so not? we already have the program. This would be another um, addition, I think, a good addition to mm -hmm. that program. And that so, would allow, um, in a way, um, contact, like live contact, and talk about books, talk about uh, characters, and uh, comparing. Or So it's just if, if it's nothing, okay, at least to meet and at least to uh, let them know that we are here for, for everything you, you might So, say. Ukane, to reach that population that is not connected to our schools or to a teacher, what we could say over the summer is if you have a best friend, you know, to join, it doesn't matter if they're in our school or not. Yeah. You know, so... Um, and to tie into the emotional and the fun part that you could dress up as your favorite character mm -hmm. and then go yeah. that day to read, you know, that that would just be fun with whatever you have in your home or available to you. 
Yeah, that's what, what I did uh, with my students. We were learning about uh, Asian civilizations and then they were dressed like, uh, <laughs> like Mayans and Inca. That would be fun. They loved it, they loved it. Yeah, that's great. So I want to be aware of our time. It's, it's, it is it's 615. This is about the time we can start uh, closing this evening. Is there anyone on the, on the call who would like to make any final remarks? Shannon, would it be mm -hmm. possible, because I want to make sure Zoga gets this contact, could you go to another, the next slide? Mm -hmm. and so right here, this is the one, this is kind of my last slide anyway. So Zoga, this is the gal that I thought you would be really uh, Sorry guys, in. I... So good. Why don't you try turning off your video and just uh, if you would like to unmute yourself, see if that helps. Can you hear me? It's it's weird. You're warping. Are you there, Zoga? Hello. So, uh, Robin, I can share this slide with Zoga. That be, um, because this is a YouTube video that I think every educator, parent, grandparent should watch. Dr. Mm -hmm. Lisa Stroman, she's a PhD and a JD. She actually spent um, time working with the FBI in the subunit for missing and exploited children. So Zoga has just finished her master's degree on cyberbullying. And this... Um, TED Talk and her book called Unplug. So actually, if you watch the TED Talk, oftentimes she gives you a link to her ebook um, of Unplug and Raising Kids in a Technology Addicted World. She's at by no means against technology. It's just everything that you need to be aware of as a parent and a grandparent and an educator as to what's out there, the predators that are out there, how your brain changes with too much screen time. They've had PET scans of children's brains and how part of it just isn't even lit up anymore. It's the curiosity yeah. part, the frontal lobe is not lit up anymore. Um, we see issues with executive function with the younger children coming to school that get on technology way too early and spend too much screen time. So they don't have any self, they don't have their self-regulatory skills. They have much less time um, attending. Um, shorter attention span. So please look up Lisa's TED Talk. It's called Empowering Kids to Rise Above Technology Addiction. Um, all, one of the things that's just staggering okay. that's I'm in back. the book. Oh, go ahead, Zoga. Sorry, uh, I really have very bad connection. I also really enjoy this meeting. Uh, connection is so low. I hope uh, uh, this is the uh, information. For the... I think we lost her again. I think so um, too. We'll share Dr. this Robin, with her. How, how is it possible to invite Dr. Lisa in our <laughs> group here? I, I... I think she would be very happy to do that. She's extremely, extremely busy. She's here in Arizona. Know, yeah. She has a private practice in Scottsdale, but she's also working with our State Department of Education mm -hmm. as far as bringing kids back. Um, I can check with her on a future date. Um, she is, she's also started at the Digital Citizens Academy um, to work with schools and to work with families as far as um, you know, just the signs of addiction to technology, the predators that are out there for, and the online danger. So here's just one tidbit, and I don't mean to be overstep the bounds. I don't want to offend anybody, but one of the things she talks about through her research is the age that kids are introduced to pornography. Mm -hmm. Prior to COVID, it was eight years old. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine that it's probably five or six at this point. Mm -hmm. And then the age that the kids become addicted to pornography is still mm -hmm. while they're in elementary school. Mm -hmm. And so these are things that I don't think are being talked about and discussed enough um, while we're going through all this online learning and this huge technology boost that we have. It's what effect it's having on our kids' brains and their learning, their tracking ability, so their eyes, because they don't mm -hmm. track, they don't read left to right anymore. It's kind of across the top and down. 
And so um, there's just so much. And Lisa is just so knowledgeable. And this is a topic that sometimes people don't like to talk about, but it's something that all educators and all parents should be aware of as to why you don't leave your kids alone with the device, why you're constantly checking, why you talk to them about if something flashes on your screen, like a naked woman flashes on your screen, you don't click on that because then they've now got you. They are part of it. They get your screen. They get your camera. Um, it's just, it's just things that parents need to know, especially in this world of huge technology and with what Zoga was doing with her cyberbullying. There's a lot of that going on. So yeah, Shannon and I can get together. And if you want to invite Lisa, I'm sure she'd be happy to come on for at least just a, a small portion. But before that, check out her PowerPoint. You'll get to know her a little bit better. She's on every major um, TV show here in the United States, including the doctors and you know all the, the different talk shows. So she's very well known and she's a total advocate. She's not, she does have her Digital Citizens Academy, but she would give it away if she could. She is <laughs> all about information, impacting parents, supporting kids, she also sh shared with me, I, I talked to her on Monday, and she said that the amount of suicide, suicide rate among our teenagers has risen during this time of COVID. Nobody's talking about that. So I don't mean to end on a, on a downer, but this is probably the most serious topic of conversation we can have as educators and making sure our parents and our students know about this what the perils are and what the dangers are with too much technology use. Not only the physiology, but also the personal um, and the cyberbullying. So, so, so Robin, would you recommend us? Yeah. Robin, we talked about this in one of our previous Thursday night sessions, and Zoga is working on our advisory program lessons to really incorporate different, really relevant topics. And I'm wondering in, in American schools these days, do you have an advisory program? Is there someone who is meeting regularly with students to talk about social emotional issues? Or is that all now the responsibility of the core classroom teacher? We do have social workers um, in, in most of our schools. It just kind of depends on, on budget. But one of the things we didn't talk about today is what's the financial impact of COVID. Budget cuts are upwards of 25% within our schools. Um, and so social workers may be one of those that get cut, unfortunately, because you, know, you look at special area teachers, they're the first to go. Um, you know, your, your librarians, your physical education teacher, the visual and performing arts and our social workers, which if that happens, I, I really worry about the health and welfare of our students and our faculty and our community. Um, so something that I think we, we could spend one day on our conversation just on this topic. So that was part of my so point too. with bringing up conversations is maybe these are just conversation starters for future meetings that we have, mm -hmm. future PLCs mm -hmm. that we have, and maybe invite experts mm -hmm. to come and help lead our conversations, um, experts in the field that are from around the world. Um, and because this, what Lisa talks about, this is not just in the United States, this is worldwide. I think this would be a really hot topic. Mm -hmm. I do too. So I think I'm going to close on this. So um, I'm hoping that we will continue again um, uh, next Thursday. And uh, we have already many topics that we've shared over the last few Thursdays that we can flesh out like this one today. And so I think really we have a variety of themes. I'm going to share it with our team we'll look at uh, sharing that for next Thursday. But this is one of the ways, if any of you would like to be involved, is on our website, there's a, this section on our website where you can just share with us your name, your email, what you're, what you're passionate about, what your educational experience is briefly. And we're hoping to build a database where then we can actually build more and more virtual PLCs and really expand. So um, right now we're starting off small. But I think that it really one person at a time and really connecting people, uh, I think we can make a difference. So this is our, our website and it's, it's easy. We're lucky to have that domain name. And um, so I wanna thank everybody else again for coming this evening. I, really, everyone is so busy right now and it means a lot 
to have you on board. And I would say if any of the a Visionary Ed team can stay online for just a minute, maybe we would chat about next Thursday. Okay, so Good. thank you everyone. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And then I think I'm gonna, looks like Angie has been waiting. Angie, you're here. Okay, then I'm gonna I'm try here. to stop my recording, great.